Welcome to Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered. Um, last night, I'm, I was going to say, I hope you watched the State of the Union. I hope you did not watch the State of the Union unless you were watching, watching our roast that we had of the, the live reaction of the State of the Union coverage, which I think would be the only way to watch that dumpster fire. So the State of the Union last night, I, come, I walk away from that really questioning the Department of Justice's assessment after interviewing Joe Biden that he comes off as a well-meaning elderly man. Because remember, that was the reason why they didn't want to charge him with anything, uh, because he just seems to be an elderly, well-meaning man. We don't think that that would play very well to a jury. So we're just going to, you know, cover this, wash our hands of it and let it go away. And I'm watching this man stand up on a stage in front of America and just lie, just blatantly lie. And, you know, I did say that he would yesterday. I knew that he was going to lie. And so it's like, why can I not stomach these lies when I knew that he was going to do it? Because you can't, how else does he stand up on stage and say anything other than I've been an utter and dismal failure from day one. I have done nothing good for this country. I mean, he can't say that. He can't say what is actually true, what we're seeing happen before our very eyes. So he has to lie. Otherwise, what's the point of this? But I want to play Joe Biden. This is cut to Joe Biden shuffling from the White House into the car just to even get to the State of the Union address on Capitol Hill. Watch. There's the fir- I'm sorry to interrupt, but there is the first couple. There first he is. Lady Jill this Biden. is a little Joe Biden shuffle. Look at that bigger. How are you feeling, sir? He was asked, and he said, "Good." Oh, he senior staff did a little muscle flex of some sort. <laughs> I would imagine <laughs> he was doing very good, good at that particular moment. He gets into the beast. Leaving the White House had to have been like. That had to have been right after he was injected with whatever cocktail they gave him to allow him to be awake at 9 p.m. I'm sure he was feeling real good right about then. Um, But so he gets in the car. He shuffles his way to the car. He gets in the car. He drives on over to deliver the State of the Union address. And at a certain point, they were like, well, we don't know if he's going to actually be able to get here because of all of the pro-Palestinian protesters surrounding the place. Here's some of that. So um, it's very cute. They think that they're doing something. And I personally love watching this happen Of course, the left radicalizes these people so often. You see this with the pro-Palestinian protests. You see this with the climate change activists. They are radicalizing these poor, useful idiots. And then all that it does is just they just eat their own and they just weaponize it against the leaders when they aren't radical enough. And honestly, we love to see it. But so... Joe Biden finally shuffles his way into the chamber uh, past all of these, you know, adoring 85 year old fans that he has. And I want to play just the opening statement that he gave. This is cut three. Joe Biden's opening statement during the State of the Union last night. My fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation. And he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, My purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack both at home and overseas at the very same time. This is... It goes back to the the Democrats being the party of projection. The amount of projection that was in in 
embedded in that statement. I mean, first of all, it's not a democracy, okay? But this democracy that they claim that they love so much, where are the threats coming from? The threats are, of course, coming from Joe Biden's regime. The threats are, of course, coming from the way that he has weaponized the judicial system against average Americans and against his political opponent. Of course, if you want to talk about any sort of threat to your beloved democracy that you claim that we have, the threats are, co the calls are coming from inside the house. It's you, Joe. It's your regime, Joe. And so he kind of set the stage for how the rest of the, the, the address would go. And it's not lost on me that he started the speech right after he did his intro there. He started the speech talking about Ukraine. Now, I don't know if he got the memo, but this was supposed to be the state of America, the state of our union, not the state of Ukraine's union. And... It was so tone deaf that he he went from U Ukraine and how we need to funnel more of our taxpayer money over to this money laundering operation in Ukraine. And then after he got done with Ukraine, he switched over to January 6th that happened three years ago as if it was somehow a relevant topic right now. And by the way, the only way that it is relevant is to talk about the people like my friend investigative reporter here at The Blaze, Steve Baker, who is being politically persecuted by, by these people, by the DOJ, the weaponized DOJ. And that's, the that's the only way that January 6th is relevant right now. So amazingly, it took Joe Biden 41 minutes into his speech to mention the biggest issue for American voters, which is, of course, the border. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth between Joe Biden and Marjorie Taylor Greene beforehand, before he got up on stage where she was confronting him on saying Lakin Riley's name. Of course, this is the 22-year-old nursing student from uh, Georgia who was killed recently by an illegal immigrant. Turns out he was a gang member. Yeah. Remember when Trump was slammed for saying that we have rapists and murderers and gang members coming across the border? Didn't take a rocket scientist to understand that he was right. So Lake and Riley murdered by a gang member who was let into this country by the Biden regime. And I want to play an exchange. This is Marjorie Taylor Greene, MTG, kind of heckling uh, Joe Biden, cut 10, heckling Joe Biden, uh, trying to get him to say the name of Lake and Riley, which I wish that she would have just not said it in this moment because it seemed like he was forgetting what he was even saying, and she kind of interrupted his brain fart, so to speak. Watch. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, Who? an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. Lincoln That's Riley? Right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, oh I gosh. say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. Why is look, it about you, Joe? It's the not dynamic about you. At the border. People pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border. You have created the if climate. They get by, if they get by and let into the country. You guys, I watched this last night and I'm pissed off all over hearing. again. <clears throat> and it's worth the, taking the chance of the 8,000 dollars. But, but if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and come all that way knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. Folks, I would respectfully say to suggest my friend, my Republican friends, owe it to the American people. Get this bill done. We need to act now. Okay, so <clears throat> just to clarify how these things work around here, because we do have a dementia patient in chief who isn't quite aware of how this process is, of course, abused by these illegal immigrants. Um, so here's the deal, Joe. First of all, you probably deserve some commission, uh, commission check every month from all of these coyotes, all of these, you know, human traffickers that are smuggling these people into the country. You have created the climate in which they have succeeded. You have created the climate in which they are now raking in the millions because you are allowing this to happen on your watch. But they don't show up to these asylum hearings. Like, that's the whole point, Joe. He's talking about, oh, well, if we just had a, uh, we're, we're just going to process them quicker, which means instead of six years, we'll get to them in six months. They're not showing up to the court dates, Joe. 
That's the whole point. They know you will give them a piece of paper with a court date on it and they're going to super duper pinky promise to be there and then, oh, oops, gosh, darn it, they didn't show up. And then what? That's the entire way that they have decided to abuse this process. They don't care that you're giving them six months or six days or whatever the case may be. They just want in. They're not showing up. That's how this has always worked. And he went on to, uh, to talk about, lie about this so-called border bill that he mentions there. He actually had the audacity, this man, to get snippy and condescending with the Republicans about killing this bill that would have, by the way, done nothing to secure the freaking border. Let's listen to cut nine. In November... My team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. This is a blatant lie. Oh, you don't think that so? That is a lie. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives no. got together and said it was a good bill? Conservatives did not do that. I'll be darned. That's amazing. There was like three. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges to help tackle the backload of two million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies to process so people into the in country where they don't instead belong. Of six years now. Look at these dolts. What are you against? Ooh, 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 ooh. This is all a lie. more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's killing thousands of children. This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. The what? It would also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border. When the number you of migrants already at the border is have that authority. The you could Patrol do Union it now. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is, yeah, yeah. You're saying low, look at the facts. Yes, look I at know, the facts. I know you know how to read. Um, <clears throat> well, you know what? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm, in, I'm going to, uh, I wanna take a quick break and I wanna bring in my panel. And I wanna talk about more about this absolute, absolute dumpster fire, uh, including the media response, which was just absolutely laughable. So let's get back into this when we return. All right, joining me now, we have Matthew Marsden, Blaze TV contributor, and also we've got for the first time the beautiful Danielle D'Souza Gill. She is the author of The Choice, The Abortion Divide in America. I'm so glad. I'm always glad that you're here. You're uh, yeah, yeah, an old timer, okay? I'm so glad that you're here. Well, thank you for having me. This yeah. is going to be so fun. It, yes, we're very, very glad that you're here. And if you will allow me, I will use and abuse you and have you here more often. Oh, she will. Oh my gosh. Anytime there are females. Oh, neighbors, I yeah, mean. we are. We are. Anytime there are females in the area, I'm like, come. Um, please bring bring up the estrogen levels in this place because, um, you know, the pink and purple isn't enough now. Mm -hmm. So so I assume that you it's OK if you didn't. Honestly, uh, I'm just a glutton for punishments and I watch the State of the Union. I assume that you guys, if you didn't watch it, you at least got caught up uh, of the highlights or I should say lowlights of what happened. And I want to get your thoughts on that. But I want to play one of the biggest manipulation uh, twist contorting of statistics and truth possibly that there was during the night, which was Joe Biden lying once again about the 15 million jobs he created under his watch. Watch. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years. A record. A record. It's an absolute lie. Unemployment. At 50 year lows. No, it's not. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs in America and counting. Mm -mm. Where 
stars are written, we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world. We are. We will. All right. Stop. 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 <laughs> it is so disingenuous to watch him, first of all, lie about the, the jobs created under his watch. Uh, second of all, try to manipulate and use COVID as like a, hey, we shut you guys all down and we're going to take credit for allowing you back into, you know, your workforce. But to take the, basically the platform of Donald Trump, which is the Make America Great Again, America First, we should have manufacturing jobs here, we shouldn't be outsourcing uh, to India and China and all these other places, and to act like, hey, if you want manufacturing to come back, I'm your guy, is just like, no, but there can't be anyone who believes that. Danielle. Yeah, no, and I think the fact that he's talking about hope, it's like he looks like the least hopeful person I've ever seen. <laughs> he's full of rage. Yes. And it's just sad because he's trying to be angry. He's trying to, like, stir up the crowd, and yet he's clearly losing his mind, and he's frail and weak, yeah. but trying to be so angry. So I think just those two things together just makes you think, like, wow, I just I just am so, I'm so worried about him being up there. Yeah. But at the same time, it's scary because he's the president. So, right, right. right. Well, well, right. And it's like, I felt like going into it, the bar that was set was like, don't die. <laughs> like, that's the bar that we're working with. And so, you know, is don't fall over. Yeah, right. Don't and, go down the stairs. Yes. Don't look away from the teleprompter. And so it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess he was successful in the sense that he he stayed upright the entire time. But but you're right, Danielle, like the, the rage, the anger that he displayed it's almost as if, call, call me crazy, it's almost as if the synapses are not all firing and he's reading the words, but his brain is not really connecting with the words because he doesn't know where he is. I don't know. No. Just a theory I have. No. <laughs> you know what gets me about this is, and, and they continue to do this, and it's actually a really, really successful formula, which it shouldn't be if we had a decent media that would actually hold them accountable for this, is they just blatantly lie. And they lie because then what they'll do is they'll cut and paste that, they'll put it into their Instagram and their, their, their X feeds and just push it out there and say, this is the way it is. It, even though everybody knows that that is not their lived experience. You can't tell me that there's hope in the country, right? The, the only hope is that he's going to be gone in November. Yeah. That's the first thing. You can't tell me there's more jobs. You can't tell me that f people are feeling better about uh, overall. About I mean, I know for myself being in, in, in the great state of Texas, have you looked at your electricity bill recently? Right. It's gone. Whoo. So that they are either they just live in this complete bubble which I, I they do right so that they don't have to worry about the things that we have to worry about that you yeah. saw that back in the day with the um with healthcare they the congress opted out of the healthcare they, they didn't have to uh, adhere to the same standards that everyone else does in the country right so they live in this little bubble and and so they just go and they go okay this is the way it is oh yeah my advisors tell me that there's hope but I don't even think that even, like you said, he doesn't even think anything through. He's just, he's just like mm. rolled out there. Mm. Jim Henson's working at the back, like, you know, move the mouth, <laughs> move the mouth. Uh, and he's out there and he's just saying whatever is there. And then he thinks, okay, I've got to do emotion. I mean, look, as an actor, you know, if, if you're a really, really bad actor, emotion's either like angry or crying, right? And he's like, I just want to say that there's going to be hope. There's hope. I tell you, there's hope. <laughs> and you're like, this guy is clearly not all there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He looks like a puppet because he is a puppet. Really yeah, and so that's the way he's he's portraying himself. Yeah, and I think that he wanted to seem so angry because he thinks, oh, Trump is this vigorous, strong candidate who's out there, so he has to seem strong because otherwise he comes across as super weak, mm -hmm. and people know that he is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people know that he is a frail, very elderly man. Um, so okay, so. I talked about the uh, I played the the clips from Joe Biden on the border, Joe Biden butchering uh, Lake and Riley's name, calling her Lincoln Riley, who I believe is a, a football coach. But <laughs> the mess up in the left size in the radical left size was only that Joe Biden, when addressing the border issue, when addressing the Lake and Riley issue, the mess up was that he used the term illegal, which is not allowed, according to Nancy Pelosi on drunk Nancy on CNN last night. Now, you should have said undocumented, but I, that's not a big thing. OK, 
What, what's the big thing yeah, about no, 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 I was I, I actually wasn't even going to ask about <laughs> that. I was so just going to ask more about the moment. But you do think that he should have said undocumented? That wasn't going to be my question. Well, we usually say undocumented. Uh-huh. He said well, we, we usually say undocumented. Here as a radical left, we like to say undocumented. We don't ever say illegal, and we certainly don't say alien. I'm just going to chug my vodka now. I mean, the sheer audacity... That, that's the issue. That's the issue when it comes to Lake and Riley. We can't call the murderer illegal. We have to say undocumented. That's what that's what their takeaway was on the border issue. Could you imagine a more tone deaf party at this point? Yeah, I mean, the double standard is crazy because in the one sense, she's saying, oh, we're just going to call them undocumented, which assumes there's no such thing as illegal. You're meant to be here. Mm-hmm. You just don't have your right paperwork because we've had some delays in getting you your your ID. But at the same time, Biden is saying that he's blaming Republicans for the border crisis. So if he's going to say, oh, we need to fix the border crisis, or at least that's what his lies are. Right, he's right. lying by saying that, but he wants to, it to seem Pretending. like he's blaming the Republicans. Yeah. Then at the one hand, it's like, well, why are you blaming the Republicans if you guys are also saying there's no such thing as an illegal? Mm-hmm. Either there are illegals who come into this country that we need to stop, we need to build the wall, or great point. we have open borders and we just let anybody do whatever they want. So Biden, Pelosi, they're really not in sync, clearly, and that's what happens when you have someone that you're trying to feed lies to on the teleprompter. Mm-hmm. They just go off one way and then she goes on CNN and says some other thing the other way. So I think the Democrats are at a crossroads. They don't know what to do because yeah. they know people don't want an open border. They know that we need to secure the border. That's the big thing that the Republicans are focusing on. So either they try to appropriate the message, kind of like you were saying Biden was doing with the manufacturing job, mm-hmm. saying, oh, no, it's me. Right. Or you have to go full on open borders. Yeah. I don't think they know what to do. To Danielle's point, Matt, um, they did for a very long time. We have clip montages of them saying the border is secure. The border is secure. The border is secure. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, right before campaign season uh, or during campaign season, Joe Biden's like, yeah, we all knew the border's broken. It's been broken for a really long time. And I'm going to be the guy to fix it as if the last three years he hasn't just completely decimated it. All the way through what you were saying, I was looking for the swear jar. <laughs> Just looking, we I'm don't like, have it's it. Not there. We so, don't have it. That's because it's called unfiltered. So you don't need the swear jar. I don't need the swear jar. Or I have to stop being a better person as I keep that. Ta- <laughs> no. Look, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> oh, as an immigrant to this country, of course, I've been told because I'm white and I'm a male that that doesn't matter, that I haven't had the same experience as the majority of other people. It drives me bonkers. I have a son right now sitting in the UK who has a four year wait to come in the country. Illegally. Okay, so I, I want to ask the Biden administration this. If there is no such thing as an illegal, if my son gets on a plane tomorrow and flies here, are you going to kick him out of the country? Are you going to do that? Because we, we're being punished for doing things the right way. Now, I'd like to think that I'm a moral individual or try and be a moral individual, so I'm going to do it the right way because I don't believe that the first action you do when you come into a country that is going to bring you in is you break the law. You don't do that. They are f- I'm not going to say <laughs> they're illegals. They are illegals yeah. if, if, because here's the thing. What's the opposite of that? Legal. Right. So if you don't do something legally, then you are illegal. It's just it, yeah. th- these words matter. They really, really matter. So when my, co- when my son, do you think my son, who, by the way, and I like to, I love the people say, oh, you know, you're white. Well, he's actually not. He's brown, right? Does that allow him in? Does that give him a special card? to come in, that when he gets to that border, when he gets to the, those customs agents, he says, I'm sorry, you can't stop me because there is no such thing as an illegal person. Now move out the way and let me come in. He will be back on that flight quicker than you can snap your fingers. It is disgusting to me. It is, and I'll tell you this, there are millions of legal immigrants yeah. in this country that are furious about this. I had one guy, let me just say this quickly. I think I told you before. I had a guy that was over here that was an SIV. He came over from Afghanistan. And the first thing he said to me, he was an Uber driver when I was in um, uh, 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 in Savannah, I think it was. Uh, and he said to me, uh, I said, oh, where are you from? He goes, Afghanistan. I came here legally. <laughs> it's the first thing he said to me. And he, th- because they're pissed off. They're mad that they're being bundled in with all these... What they, they are criminals. If you break the law, you are a criminal. That is it. That is it. Yeah. Rent over. And I didn't swear. Wow. Congrat- 
Matt's growing. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not. So there's no telling what might come out of my mouth next. But I will try to be on my best behavior for Danielle. Oh, gosh. You too. (laughs) Um, Okay. So I do. I know we have to take a break. So here's what I want to do. Let's when we come back, I do want to talk about the GOP's response because it does need to be called out. It was disastrous. But I know we have to take a break. So let's get into that when we return. All right. So in true GOP fashion, um, we get handed this opportunity on a silver platter, right? Like when when the guy's job is don't die and the bar has been set that low, it's like, all right, we know he's going to go out there. We the, the, the speech is already published before he goes out. So, you know, the lies he's going to tell. You have an opportunity to, you know, um, I don't know address all of these lies and you want to pick the best person to do so. And it's very easy because they're just all blatant lies that you can completely prove false. Well, what they decided to do instead was trot out uh, Senator from Alabama, Katie Britt, who I think thought that she was like auditioning for a Lifetime movie or something. And this was instead what we got from the GOP's response. I never could have imagined what my story would entail. To think about what the American dream can do across just one generation in just one lifetime. It's truly breathtaking. But right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families Uh are hurting. Our country can do better. (laughs) And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. (laughs) President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time. But minutes after taking office, he suspended all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis, he invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. I just died from secondhand embarrassment. This is, is painful to watch. And honestly, I <laughs> I was on with um, Megyn Kelly earlier. Oh, I always forget to self-promote. I was on with Megyn Kelly earlier. So make sure that you go check that out on her YouTube channel. But I said, I was like, I don't even know what she's like. She could have had the most substantive uh, speech. I wouldn't know it. I wouldn't know it because I was too busy being completely bothered by how overdramatic that is. And I want to go to uh, to the actor first. What what are you, is that like Academy Award winning performance? I just sat there and thought, I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> it is that was appalling? I mean, that was really. I mean, I I don't even know what to say about that. It was so bad. I mean, I, who told I, her? I yes, tell you. I couldn't tell you what she said. That's what I'm saying. Just watching her going. What is she doing? This is so weird. It's like, yeah. and then my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And well, I mean, <laughs> speaking of like the tone, not matching what you're saying, you know, she's talking about really bad things. And then all of a sudden she'll like smile just to be em- put emphasis on the point. And then she'd get really sad, slow again. What are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing, Danielle? Oh, my gosh. Well, I will say I do feel bad for her. I feel like she's probably not used to clearly doing interviews. <laughs> like, I mean, she is a senator. So, OK, you, 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 you clearly had yeah. to put yourself out there to do that. But I think she wanted to come across like, oh, look, I'm in my kitchen. Yes. I'm just a normal mom who's just kind of like affected by the border. But then at the same time, she was getting like 
Disney princess, like happy, but also like sad and dark. Yeah. So it was kind of like <laughs> frozen gone wrong. I think it was just, it just went off a cliff. I think she would have done better had she just acted a little bit more normal. Mm-hmm. Like just right. like chill for a sec, take a deep breath. You know, it's okay. Let's just kind of start again kind of thing. I, I think it just, it just got a little too wound wound tightly like mm-hmm. too intense um but i think that the gop should have just gone a totally different direction and yes. should have instead just said hey let's eviscerate biden yeah. let's respond on every single point you know this is what's happening at the border this is what you did here this was a lie this was a lie this was a lie we don't have to always be emotional and appeal to a specific demographic every time we want to make a point sometimes you can just respond with the facts and right. that speaks for itself because Biden himself was such a train wreck that it's like we don't need to respond with our own train wreck right. that's like people it, don't know what to make of it. It it's, distracts from the point. Yeah. Right. Because because now what we're talking about here on this show is how disastrous the response was not, hey, we really hammered home all of the reasons why Joe Biden is a liar. And it's just completely lost on them now because Which, because they wanted to play at the end of the day, they wanted to play identity politics. You can't tell me that there wasn't some white man within the ranks that would have been better at delivering an effective response. You just can't. But they're like, well, we need the woman. And look, she's pretty and she's young. And we, oh, I know she can do it from her kitchen. That will be relatable. She can bake <laughs> and run the country at the same time. No, I mean, again, clearly... Who is advising them on this? Like, who, uh, you know, we've spoken about this many, many, many times when it comes to the culture. The left will go to Hollywood, Mm -hmm. right? That's where they'll go. They'll go and get Spielberg or whoever to come in and go, hey, listen, can you coach? And that's why they had such a slick guy in Obama. Like, Obama was like super, super slick. And what we, you're entirely right. What we should have done then was gone, hey, listen, we're the serious party. We, we want to get things fixed. Right. We want to we take substantive steps to fix the issues that the country's facing right now. And they just totally blew it. Mm-hmm. They totally, and putting them in the, putting her in the kitchen. <laughs> like, I mean, who said like, they- I get the intention, but like, it feels so contrived. The whole thing was a complete car wreck. Yeah. I like, put Rand Paul up there. I, I, I'll tell you this. Did you see Carrie Lake? No. Carrie Lake, totally dialed in. She's been in front of the camera for years and years and years. Fantastic. Does does she did a little response about? It. And I'm like, yeah, she could have done it. Yeah, she, she could have totally awesome. done it. So yeah. many other senators would have been awesome. And she is a woman, so you could have had your identity politics box box checked and still gotten an effective response. Yeah. Not to mention Arizona is affected by the border. Mm-hmm. They could have picked someone who's maybe has some you know, experience with their state with that. I mean, it's unfortunate because I think we have these opportunities. We're thinking, oh, look, there are all going to be all these people who tune in. Maybe we'll reach some swing voters. Maybe we'll reach some people who actually turn on the State of the Union once a year and want to hear thoughts. But unfortunately, then we blow it. And then people probably think to themselves, why do I even pay attention to politics? Mm -hmm. Why do I even watch any of this? Joe Biden's a loon and this woman is disturbed so <laughs> why am i here why 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 am i doing this that's what friends that i know who are not political would think yeah i watched that and i just thought this is completely endemic of what the country the state of the country right now they're both useless yes both the gop and the democrats are absolutely terrible i mean if, if that is the best if you're an alien coming down and you were looking at the first of humanity at the first time you go i'm gonna go to the most powerful country in the world and let's look at the leaders of that country you go new kit yeah like, <laughs> like new yeah we'll pass we're going back to our uh we're going back to our planet no thank you um all right so let's go ahead and i want to take a quick break and then i want to get into um some other news here but first we want to uh, remind you guys For those of you who have not heard, uh, there is a conference going on over in Nashville, and it is being led by Jason Whitlock. It is the Fearless Army Roll Call 2.0. It is brought to you this year by Preborn, and it's an all-day event in Nashville, Tennessee on June 1st. That's going to—it's going to—if you're a man— I'm sorry, but it is a little bit exclusive. All right. It's for men. Okay. It's going to bring men together under a united banner of godliness and responsibility. And you're going to hear speeches from Jason and several special guests. So if that appeals to you, make sure to go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com to reserve your spot. That is fearlessarmyrollcall.com. All 
All right. So in uh, some more news that's happening right now, there was a, a bipartisan bill. They always say oh, it's a bipartisan bill. This was introduced on the House floor yesterday that could potentially ban the app, the social media app, TikTok in the United States. And following that bill being introduced, executives at TikTok sent out notifications to users urging them to speak out which apparently led to the users calling their local representatives and either threatening suicide in some cases or threatening to assassinate the representatives if they voted in favor of this ban. Uh, Matthew Foldy, a reporter for The Spectator, posted this on the platform formerly known as Twitter. Insane. Another office is reporting to me that they have gotten suicide threats by American children who called to try to prevent TikTok from being owned by an American company or uh, this one. We had a voicemail from last night where the caller said, I'll kill you if you don't give me TikTok. I would say the first uh, red flag that this app is a problem is the apparent obsession that these children have to the app that they would threaten to both harm themselves and harm others if the app was taken away from them. I would say that might be a problem for like their psyche. I don't know. Call me crazy. But maybe you're kind of proving the point that it is damaging your entire childhood existence. You're being indoctrinated into all of these social justice agendas. And by the way, I had uh, author Peter Schweitzer on earlier this week and we were talking about, you know, all of the ways that China is trying to destroy our country. TikTok is one of those ways. They don't have TikTok in China. They have a version of it, but you don't get to post the social justice crap that they are allowed to post in America. That is reserved only for us so we can confuse and create all of this chaos within our children and within their childhood. And I just would ask, like, parents, are you like, do you, are you seeing this? Are you willing to, like, do something about it? Because the idea that children are just calling up legislators and saying these things is very alarming to me. I'm glad, to be honest, because I think that it's exposing what most parents know is that your kids shouldn't be on social media apps right. at all. Right. They shouldn't be. And look, is it difficult? Yeah, it is. I know. I have a bunch of. I've, as you said, I have thirty thousand children, so uh, <laughs> so I know how difficult it is. But the more people that come along and and get together and do this and say, "Look, we're not having social media apps." Because, by the way, going back to the thing about TikTok in China, it is used as an educational tool in China. Yes. Yes. But it's also used as an educational tool in America, but not the kind of education that we should really want, right? right. For the, over there, it's like math. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, sciences, whatever. Over here, it's indoctrination. And it's it's clearly a psyop. I mean, I, I resisted for the longest time getting TikTok. And recently, uh, I've got a, an account on it, and I haven't used it at all. I think that absolutely this is a wake-up call. I think that, again, if you're a parent out there, get your kids off social media, mm -hmm. right? You're They're, they're literally undoing every single bit of good work that you're doing. Try and pressure your school, the school that the kids are in to ban social media in the schools. Mm -hmm. The school that my kid goes to has no social media. It's like kind of social contract between us. We sign on and we say, hey, listen, our okay. kids are not going to be a part of that. It's so important because you see it now all the time, like kids like walk around like this. Mm -hmm. They're just attached to their phones and, it, and it, it, it's clearly affecting them in ways that we won't really know perhaps for another 10 or 15 years, but we're seeing it with this now. Stop having your kids on social media, guys. Yeah. It's hard, but that's your job. That's And that's the thing that gets me. Um, Danielle, I know you're a new mom. And that's the thing that just, the amount of people that I hear that are like, um, they'll say, you know, we're, we're, we talk about my sons go to a small private Christian school. And we talk about, you know, um, if some one of the kids in like fifth grade starts talking about sex, and, you know, who they're going to have sex with when they get older or whatever. And most of us are like, I could, like my kid did, doesn't even know what that is. Right. Because we have we have not given them access to this type of thing. But most often I hear parents say, well, they're going to they're going to learn about it on social media anyway. And I'm like, why are you just why are you just resigning yourself to like, oh, well, they're going to have to learn about it on social media when the correct answer is just don't give them social media. And it seems to be so hard for these parents to say the word no. And it's like, why, why are you having kids if not to raise them and parent them and guide them in the, the correct way?
Right. And it's kind of like you see these crazy videos of kids doing things on their phones. And it's like, well, how do you think they have the phone? Right. It's because you bought them this phone and gave it to them. And you gave them access to internet, social media apps, which has all kinds of things on it. So I couldn't imagine... I mean, expecting anything different from them. In a way, it's like, how can you blame them? Because they're kids. They don't know better. We're adults. We're supposed to be teaching them what to do. And instead, we're basically just letting them become addicted to screens. A lot of them have ADD. A lot of them also have issues even with Instagram, so separate from TikTok. But that study that was showing that all these young girls, they feel horrible about themselves. They compare themselves all the time. So it's like, even for adults to deal with this, it's like, I don't even want to be on social media all the time. But if we were going on it, at least we can like put it away and know that, okay, we have to move on. But when you're a kid, I mean, imagine the amount of bullying that goes on in school, then that goes on to social media. I mean, you it's like you can never escape it mm-hmm. because it's following you everywhere you go. You have your phone with you everywhere. And then you can't really be a kid anymore. Yeah. And it just takes a few bad eggs to just like, well, but the, but all the kids in my class have a phone. Why can't I have one? Because you can't. Because I said so. Because I'm your mother. Unfortunately for you in this case. <laughs> it's just like, and then I'm like, why are you guys giving these young children phone? You're giving them access to like the completely demonic world that we live in. Why? Why? And most often it is, it's iPhones. And I'm like, Guys, what are we doing here? My kid has like the little, you know, um, uh, watch that like it's totally locked down and it has GPS and only we can call him and he can only text with us and it doesn't even have like a keyboard. He has to voice text like that's I'm like, I see the um, the importance of being able to track you and monitor you. But there's another way. You don't just have to give it all to them. Well, people are outsourcing their parenting. They are. You know, they feel like they don't. You know, kids... It's funny, there's a, a, a theologist called Frank Sheed who said he, when he was talking about faith, he said too many people wear their faith like a button or like a pin on their clothes. And I think it's the same about children now have become accessories to parents, right? That They're not really investing in them as people. I, I hate to say it. And part of that, part of that, even though they might not even realize it, is when parents say, he's my best friend or she's my best friend. No, no. You are not meant to be your children's friend. Yeah. That is bullshit. You are meant. (laughs) You did it. You said you were a better person. I didn't drop the F bomb though. (laughs) So it's uh, little, little wins. Yeah. yeah. But you're meant to be their parent. You are not meant to be their friend. And that doesn't mean, you know, you have to be okay with being unpopular. Mm -hmm. You have to be okay with them screaming at you. You have to understand that that is part of the process of, of creating and molding the soul of a young person. Mm -hmm. So there's too much outsourcing of parenting, whether it's dropping the kids off all the time or doing this or that, you know, you, you've got to be engaged on every single level. And it's look, it's difficult. I know. Mm. And you have to deal with all these different personalities, especially if you have a big family like I've got, but the alternative is you create little monsters that go on to become Democrats. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if that. they're spending all the time on their phone, who's influencing that? I mean, hopefully they're 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 watching this show. Hopefully they're tuning into conservative media, but probably they're getting indoctrinated with all kinds of things from liberal TikTok influencers. I mean, the amount of lunacy on TikTok. That's why libs of TikTok, the X yeah. account, is a big thing because it's like there is actually this amount of lunacy on TikTok right. that and, and we're they, just exposing. And right. they think that that is the world, right? Because if you, I was saying this to a friend of mine the other day, if when you move, like we moved here from California, the fact of the matter is, is we have a very small group of friends, right? So you're always around the same the same group of friends. You, you, know, you move to Texas and people think, oh, you're moving to this new place. Well, no, you don't normally move outside of like five to 10 miles, especially in Texas, yeah. right? So when you're doing that, you have a small kind of circle, like people in the circle of trust. And then you've got social media that's mm-hmm. right in there. And that, that is completely tearing up all these other contacts and, and relationships that you're building. It's just throwing in this poison that poisons the well. And people feel like, oh, it's just a machine. No, it's the people that are on the machines that are in, that infiltrate into your kids' minds. Yeah. And then unfortunately, the rest of the world is supporting that. Right. So you have a real uphill battle, especially when all, I say all media, 90% of the media is pushing that way. 
Yeah, I just thought I would share that as like a wake up call um, to parents. Like, guys, if th- like that's a problem. If your child is threatening to kill themselves because they are not going to have access to TikTok, like take TikTok away. That's a that's a problem. That's a uh, I wouldn't even say red flag. That's like blaring red lights flashing right in front of you. Um, all right, we've got to uh, we got to take a quick break, but first we want to thank our sponsor, uh, this segment, Fast Growing Trees. So Fast Growing Trees, if you haven't heard of it, it's the biggest online nursery in the United States. They've got over 10,000 different kinds of plants, over 2 million happy customers. They've got a- anything you need. They've got you covered. They've got house plants like lemon, avocado, olive, fig trees, whatever you want. You can do it inside your home. I don't know if you realize that. Um, and they you they make it very easy to order online. Your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. They also have a 30-day alive and thrive guarantee. They also offer free plant consultation forever, which I personally need. I love fast growing trees. Um, I love all of their options. It's, and it's very easy to navigate the site. And if you're like, oh, it's part shade. Oh, it's all sun. Oh, if this will thrive better in this climate. They've got it all to do uh, all of the work for you because used to anything that I touched that was green, I like I have the opposite of a green thumb. Like it just it just would die. Like it's like King Midas, but with plants. Like anytime I touched it, it, ju- it just dead. Um, but fast growing trees has helped me to actually uh, have these thriving, thriving plants. So also, I would just say as an added bonus, um, you don't get dirt and stuff. You can go into these big box nursery stores and you get dirt and stuff inside your car. You don't have to do that, okay? So um, make sure that you uh, go there. You can get an additional 15% off your first purchase if you use the code Sarah over at fastgrowingtrees.com. That is fastgrowingtrees.com, promo code Sarah. All right, before we go here, um, I want to play a an influencer. We're talking about all of these social media apps. Here is some of what you might see on the TikToks of the world talking about all the terrible things Donald Trump will do if elected. Watch. And here are the first 15 promises he has made if he is reelected. You may have heard of Project 2025, but this is from Agenda 47. And you can read all of these on his website. Okay. First, he promises that he will carry out the largest domestic deportation operation in Ace. history. He will I'm also in. ask yes. for a death sentence for anyone convicted of human trafficking. Great. He will close <laughs> the Department of Education and return all education standards to the states to decide. Yes, sign me up. He will put right. prayer back into school and Absol- he will criminalize any race-based advantage programs. Amazing. He will end yeah. the Affordable Care Act. Yes. He will ban gender-affirming care for adults and yes. children. And he will ban any federal yes. dollars from going towards gender affirming care. Okay. Win. Put that on a campaign ad and broadcast it all over the country. That she just wrote a campaign ad for him. I wouldn't she, miss, he, I, I don't know. No, I see. <laughs> I know, Although I she know. said he a lot about Trump. Yeah, that's true. I, I, listen, you never know. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I think that's very presumptive. <laughs> it's just like, we're going to be censored. Don't threaten me with a good time. Those all sound awesome. I can't wait to vote for for Donald Trump in November. All right, guys, Danielle, Matthew, I should say gal and guy, thank you.